Hello and welcome to Commons Current Events Roundtable. Today we have a very exciting guest and it's something, a show that I have not done before and it's something that I wanted to do. And my guest is Roberta Rosenthal Qual, who is a Raymond P. Nero, did I pronounce it correctly, professor of law at DePaul University. And we're going to be talking about her book, The Myth of the Cultural Jew. Welcome to Commons Roundtable. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Thank you for having me on the show. And I see that we also have your book right next to me. I feel, in fact, we have two copies today, one that I may read out of and one that's on the table. Yes. So um, it, it, it's a very, very interesting book. And I'd like to open with a little bit about the book. And this is what it's about. In certain circles, one often hears somebody say that he or she is a cultural Jew. This statement is intended to mean that the speaker is not religious but still identifies as Jewish from a cultural standpoint. The main premise of the book, The Myth of the Cultural Jew, who is also is written by our guest, is that if one identifies a cultural Jew, that person is venerably molded and shaped by Jewish tradition, which includes Jewish law. So that's a mouthful. That's and, a mouthful. And you know, a um, little earlier we we had um, we were able to have lunch together, and um, we really uh, went over some of the things that I didn't understand, and I thought, well, maybe you could, for our viewers, explain what a cultural Jew is. And you were kind of surprised that you, you, you didn't think that I, you know, of the different places that I go to, that I'd never heard the word cultural Jew before. Um, I've heard secular, I've heard this, and I've heard that, but cultural, that is something different. And I think that's what we need to clarify. What is um, a, a cultural Jew, and why is it a myth? Okay, so that's the question I almost always get about the book. What does the title mean? You know, what does it mean? And, and in fact, um, I, I often post a few things, um, you know, events and whatnot on my book, um, on my Facebook author page, and I said something about uh, recently, and I won a, a law professor who teaches in California, who's a friend of mine, wrote back and said, wait, I'm a myth? You know, because she <laughs> considers herself a cultural Jew. So I, I think there are two questions that you've asked. The first is, what is a cultural Jew? And why is cultural Judaism a myth? Right. Okay, so first of all, what is a cultural Jew? Just so we can clarify for your audience right. exactly what uh, spectrum, where on the spectrum I'm talking right, about. what you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. Right. So as I'm using the term cultural Jew, I am referring to Jews who... If you ask them what their religion is, or if you ask them what the religion they were born into is, they would say Jewish. Okay, but they're not necessarily religious in the conventional sense of the term. Mm -hmm. They are not necessarily living um, a life that is defined by Jewish law. Okay, which the technical term for Jewish law is halacha, Jewish law. And you're so, also a Jewish law professor. I do teach yeah. Jewish law. I teach Jewish family law at DePaul Law School. Right, yes. right. Um, to, to students who are Jewish and non-Jewish. It's it's yeah, because you, know, cause you but, think of DePaul Law School, you think of DePaul being a Catholic university, and here you're teaching a course on Jewish law. I, I, that is correct. Yeah. And, and my students from all religions and walks of life actually um, really enjoy learning about mm -hmm. what Jewish law has to say about issues pertaining to marriage and divorce and sex. You know, we do a lot of sex in that class. Mm -hmm. So they enjoy it. They, they really enjoy <laughs> That's it. That's the college, <laughs> they sign up for that college. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's how I market it, right? <laughs> All right, so the cultural Jews w would identify, they're identified Jews. They're not, they're not completely disengaged, but they're not observing the precepts of Jewish law. So why is that a myth? The reason it's a myth is that um, Jewish law, what we think of as Jewish law, the precepts, the ritualistic laws that Jews, according to the tradition, are bound or commanded to observe, and Jewish culture are very much intertwined together. 
Okay. Well, so that's what we need to unbundle to understand. Really. Now, Bobby, I'll call you Bobby. Absolutely, Never yeah. up, but I'll call you Bobby. Um, why did you? Uh, what made you um, write this book um, on cultural Jews? What was? What was the incentive? What gave you the ideas of writing this book? Well, ultimately, this book is about authenticity and perceived authenticity. So, as a legal academic as someone who had written about actually works of authorship, copyrighted works, mm -hmm. works of art, works of music, works of literature, for many, many years. The questions I would ask about a given work of authorship would be, um, what happens if uh, a painting is sold and the buyer changes it, changes it up a little bit, you know, adds a little mustache on the mm -hmm. Mona Lisa, so to speak. <laughs> is that work still authentic? One day, it occurred to me that if certain changes are made to religious tradition, such as the Jewish religion, you could ask the same question, is that an authentic change? And when I realized that, I realized that many of the same questions that I had been asking in the secular context of, of copyrightable works, art, music, literature, you could also apply to the Jewish tradition. And when I realized that, I realized I wanted to write a book about what really represents authenticity within the meaning of the so tradition. So Judaism, I always thought of Judaism as just a religion, like being Catholic, being Protestant. Um, and a lot of times people ask me, what, you know, where's your family from or your grandparents from? And I'll tell them the country, because most of our grandparents come from somewhere in Europe or wherever. and um, and. I, I'm not sure if they're asking me what my religion is, what my culture is. It's kind of confusing, and I always thought that Judaism, Judaism was just a religion. Okay, so that's so, a common, that's a very yeah. common um, misconception, actually, because the Jewish tradition, okay, and I'm using the term tradition very deliberately, includes a set of legal precepts, the law, mm -hmm observance of Shabbat, observance of the dietary laws, just to name a few. But it also in, includes a set of cultural practices that we do as Jews. So and you see Jews not just as a religion, but you see them as a culture. It's definitely a okay. religion, but, what's the, but the reason that cultural Judaism is a myth is because the law and the culture is completely intertwined together. Maybe I could give you an example, example yes. from secular law that right. would make this Exactly. Will resonate because, with your audience. Because I think the audience, our viewers, need to know that. And for myself, okay. I'd like to know it myself. Okay. okay. So um, here is the operation of the relationship between law and culture that I'm speaking of. But this is a secular example. Mm -hmm. This is not about the Jewish tradition. Okay. All right. So you have heard of the Miranda warnings. You have the right to remain silent. silent. Okay. Right. Everybody knows the Miranda warnings, right? right? Okay. So um, when the United States Supreme Court decided that these warning arts are constitutionally required. That was in a case many years ago called Miranda versus Arizona. The Supreme Court made that decision as a matter of law. This is what the Constitution requires. Mm -hmm. There were justices on the Supreme Court that disagreed with the constitutionality of these requirements, but they lost and the majority held these warnings are constitutionally mm -hmm. required. After, that court after the Supreme Court decided that decision, um, those warnings became part of our popular culture. You can't turn on a police show or a law show without seeing somebody right. give those warnings. Right, and if they don't, then right. it's not legal. Exactly. Okay. 34 years later, the Supreme Court had the opportunity to revisit whether those Miranda warnings are still required. And even those justices who at the time, there were a few that who mm -hmm. were still on the court or involved, who were at the time opposed to those warnings as a constitutional matter. Nonetheless, the decision was mm -hmm. that because they had become so much a part of the popular culture, 34 years later, we could not take those warnings away constitutionally. Therefore, immediately after that first Supreme Court decision, the law deeming them constitutionally mm -hmm. required influenced the culture. I after mm -hmm. that, after 34 years of popular recognition of those warnings, the culture influenced the second decision whereby they could not be revoked. That's how law and culture work together. Okay, and so the Jewish tradition right. 
is a tradition that includes the law, but it also includes the greater culture. And that greater culture, it's important to emphasize when you're talking about Judaism, the Jews have lived in lands of exile for millennia. And so the culture includes not just the cultures of the Jews, the people's practices, what the Jews are doing, the people on the ground. Mm -hmm. It also is influenced both the people's practices and even the rabbinical rulings by the greater non-Jewish culture, which was the surrounding culture. So that's what I'm saying, that the law, Jewish law, the legal precepts, the tradition, and the culture are intertwined. So here's a Jewish example. Mm -hmm. Okay, many people think that the wearing of a yarmulke, a kippah, a head covering mm -hmm. for men, that's Jewish law. But the reality is in the Talmud, you know, which is the earliest codification mm -hmm. of Jewish law, dating back to the early centuries of the Common Era, about 500 CE, doesn't really require men to wear a kippah. Where, where was that? Was that a Well, it became... Did it become a law? Because there are certain synagogues I, w I will go into and I don't need a head covering, and there'll be other ones that well, demand it for women as well as I'm men. But I'm talking about the wearing... Here what I'm talking about is the wearing of a kippah, not for prayer. Okay, just to be out and about in the community. I see. Okay. So some and people had to wear it all. Some people well, wear it all. Well, it was never the law. Yeah. It was never, again, this is where it was really never the law uh, necessarily that men had to wear a kippah all the time. But the people's practices developed so mm -hmm. that men began to cover their, their head with a kippah all the time. And therefore, the culture impacted the law. The same is true of a kosher kitchen. All right, what we think of as a typical kosher kitchen where you have two sets of dishes, right. two sets of towels, two dishwashers, all of that. Yeah. There's nothing in the Talmud that says you have that to have that. two different dishwashers. Yeah. That became Especially the, norms. In the Talmud. Right. That became the norms in medieval society, yeah. which was a very intensely religious society, both Christian and mm -hmm. Jewish, especially in the Ashkenazic communities, Germany, northern France, and so that region. Is, so it became a law through the culture, well, maybe? Exactly. Is that what the it is? people's yeah. practices okay. then developed into the law. Yeah. So back to our cultural Jews. You know, Why do I say that, right. that that's a myth? Because even cultural Jews, whether they know it or not, they're observing Jewish law. So right today is Hanukkah. We're in the middle of Hanukkah. It's just begun. Right. right? Most cultural Cultural Jews will light a menorah. Most cultural Jews will attend or host a Passover Seder. Most cultural Jews, when their kids get married, even to non-Jews, will have Jewish trappings at that wedding, a chuppah, breaking of the glass. Right. Those are part of the That is true, because I go to uh, marriages where they have two different religions, and they will have the chuppah. The Jewish trappings, and, exactly. and the glass. And that is part And the glass where they step on and exactly. break it. And right. I'm not saying that the cultural Jews are observing Jewish law to the letter. That's not what I'm saying. Right. But what I am saying is the practices of the ritualistic tradition mm -hmm. have seeped into the lives mm -hmm. of cultural Jews. And therefore, okay, the reason that that's a myth is because they are doing some Judaism. Mm -hmm. Now, that's one So the myth that means there isn't, there, that the myth is, when you say the word myth, you know, uh, it's not real, but it is real because they, they, they really are practicing. They well, are really doing it. They are not real. Maybe they don't realize they're they doing it, right. but they still are doing it. Uh, I was at a wedding recently where the, where the, uh, the, the, the girl hasn't been in synagogue since her bat mitzvah, and yet she married a non-Jew, and they had exactly the chuppah. It was in Central Park. Right. They did a chuppah, right. and and what, by holding a talit, you know, over her right. head, and the glass was still broken. Exactly, but but moving away from the title, okay. The real question, I mean, once you under, so again, part of the book, just to backtrack, is really a historical discur excursion, mm -hmm. which really discusses the development of Jewish law and how the law and how the culture interact in a variety mm -hmm. of contexts. All right, so that's that is a huge part of what the book does. Um, but the end of the book really is my attempt to be a little bit prescriptive. By that I mean, you know, well, what do we do with this now? All right, because clearly, you know, if you're if you're concerned about the transmission of the Jewish tradition, you have to be thinking about whether it's enough, you know, to do mm -hmm. what many cultural Jews are doing, and is that.